Today we finish our series, How Not to Throw the Baby Out with the Bathwater. And today is probably going to be the most controversial of all three, because we're going to speak about profits. Are they really worth the effort? Let's talk about that back in a moment. Welcome to Minister's Toolbox, providing leaders with the tools they need to succeed in ministry. Now, here's your host, Casey Sabella. For the last several weeks, we've been talking about prophecy and prophets. And uh, today we're going to conclude that series by talking about the actual ministry of prophets. If you missed any of the former episodes, I would suggest you go back and listen to them because today really kind of builds on those. So starting here is not a good idea. But today we're going to focus in on the vocational gift of prophet. That is spoken about in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 10 and 11 where it speaks about five ministries that Christ is giving to the body of Christ. As you recall, the first week we talked about the gift of prophecy of the Holy Spirit, talked about in 1 Corinthians 12. Last week we talked about the life gift of prophet, which is spoken about in Romans chapter 12. Today we're going to finish our series by talking about the ministry of prophet, which is a, a vocational gift that is something that is equal to pastor or evangelist. And once again, we already discussed the concept of whether this is relevant or not, so I don't want to get into that particular idea about this prophet ministry. But most pastors, when they think or they hear the term prophet, honestly want to switch off their brain. When we think about even introducing the concept of prophets in the New Testament or prophets in today's church, we pretty much want to just ignore it. Uh, we prefer that it's, it remains in the first century because the concept of prophets ministering today just means mess. Uh, more often than not, when we think about or when we interact with this concept of prophets, typically a prophet, if they are recognized as one, has made some sort of mess in the body of Christ. We don't, usually don't think about them having a positive impact on our congregations. So why bother with them at all? Why don't we just avoid the subject and avoid uh, th that ministry altogether? Well, unfortunately, perhaps for us, it does tell us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, excuse me, chapter 4, verses 10, 11, and then through 18, that prophets are a necessary part of preparing the church for the end times, preparing the church for the time when Jesus is going to come back and receive his bride. It tells us that all five of these ministries, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, are designed to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Without prophets, the church is not going to be properly equipped. So it isn't simply avoiding that because some people have misused that gift or that ministry, but it's trying to discover exactly what is that ministry all about and how does it benefit the body of Christ. When we look in the New Testament, we find that the early church was begun, uh, obviously, in, in Acts chapter 2, but we read about in Acts chapter 11 where there's the emergence of the Gentile church, and it is the church at Antioch. And we notice that in that church, prophets came to that particular ministry. One of them was Agabus, which we're from, very familiar with, and they ministered to the church. And as you look throughout the Acts of the Apostles, you're going to notice the interface of prophets with congregations. And they always are representing having a positive impact. We talked about last week about how prophets were part of the a discussion of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where Paul begins to say that there's prophets in your midst and that they should judge prophecy and that sort of thing. And again, we won't go over that material. But what value do prophets really play in today's church? And what or how are pastors to interact with this particular gift? That's really the important factor. Prophets are designed to speak forth. And there are those whom God has called to do this on a full-time basis. Now, they're really not recognized much in today's church, and unfortunately, the ones that are recognized, more often than not, are not bringing much of a benefit. Uh, as we've mentioned over these last few weeks and over the last election cycle, we had many who were purporting to be prophets, saying that President Trump was going to go two terms and that he was going to 
have two consecutive terms that on uh, January 20th he would be the president no matter what everybody was saying and of course we've seen that those particular prophecies did not come to pass so rather than giving us a positive view of prophetic ministry most of us just wanted to be <laughs> have nothing to do with it they brought us uh, shame if, the, if for lack of a better term unfortunately it again brings a a negative view of prophet ministry. About 30 years ago, and I am that old, uh, there was a pastor friend of mine who said, you really need to have this particular minister into your church. He has a prophetic ministry. And I have to tell you that over the phone when he said that, I just said, well, to be frank with you, I don't really want a prophetic minister in my church because even back then, there were a lot of people who were coming in the name of the Lord and they were speaking prophecies and saying things that were really not beneficial. And more often than not, I ended up having to clean up the mess after they were done. And again, I know many of you pastors and church leaders can relate to that. So when he said, I'd like to ask you to, to consider having him come to your church, I said, well, based on your reputation with me, we've been friends for many years. If you think that this person has value, then yes, I will invite them to the church and have him speak. However, before he speaks, I want to speak to him personally because he was flying into the area. I want to speak to him before the church service because I really want to validate whether this person has, uh, frankly, the authority and the validity to speak to my congregation. So I agreed to have him come and speak. Unfortunately, as typically happens in these situations, the, uh, the, the prophetic minister was late his uh, plane came in late and unfortunately he got to my church really just at the moment the church service was starting so i <laughs> didn't get the opportunity to kind of vet him and that really made me very nervous again resting entirely on the reputation of my friend i allowed this person to come in and share and so he taught for a few moments and talked about prophecy and and the various scriptures that talk about prophecy in the new testament and then he began to prophesy over the congregation what he did in that particular situation was really pretty amazing because uh, he went over to different individuals and he prayed for them. And in every single case, I was the pastor, of course, in every single case, when he prophesied over those individuals, he identified their spiritual gift and he gave them a word of encouragement that they should pursue what God was asking them to do. And I have to say he was very specific about the gift and the ability that these individuals had. He prayed over a number of people, and again, I watched because I knew many of these people, and the words that he shared were accurate each and every time. When he came over to me and gave me a prophetic word, once again, I had certain characteristics and certain things that I was testing him on, but he came over to me and he said, listen, and this was September of 1991, he said, by the end of this year, people are going to call upon you that you've never met before, and they're going to ask you to help them, and you're going to be able to go to them and give them the assistance that they need, and God is going to be with you. And he spoke a number of these different words. Well, for me, that was a perfect opportunity to test whether his prophetic ministry was valid or not, because it was September of that year, so I just had three months to see if this was going to happen. Well, in November of that year, I did get a call by a a Bible study group that had been meeting in my city and the pastor of that group was moving to uh, another place in the country and for whatever reason I don't even know how he contacted me because I had I had no knowledge of him or of anybody in that group but somehow or another and maybe he called through the yellow pages or whatever but he called me and he said listen there's this group they need a pastor and I was wondering if you can come over and minister to them and see if God would uh, use you in some way to to take this group and bring them and make them part of your church I said, well, this is extremely unusual, but I went to visit that Bible study group. And long story short, that group became a significant part of our fellowship. So a prophetic minister came in, gave a word that was fulfilled. I began a relationship with this prophetic minister that continued until the day he died. And I have to tell you that in the 20 or so times that I ministered with him or, minister, or he ministered to our congregation, each and every time he brought the reputation of Christ Everything that he shared was encouraging, and many of the words he shared, frankly, have come to pass. Some of them have yet to come to pass. I'm sharing this with you because up till that point, I didn't have really a positive view of prophetic ministry in any way. And God, in his mercy, revealed to me personally the importance of prophetic ministry. And since then, 
I have a desire to see legitimate prophetic ministry have a positive impact on the body of Christ. I have to say to you that as a, somebody who is not a prophet, that's not my calling, that I am very jealous for legitimate prophecy because I, can't, I have seen on an experiential level how prophetic ministry can really help move people closer, move people further in their walk with God. Again, prophetic ministry is not designed to be some kind of freak show. It's not designed to uh, predict the future so people can make investments in the stock market or any of these other foolish ideas about prophetic ministry. But it is designed to do the three things we've been talking about, to comfort, encourage, and exhort, to give people encouragement for the direction of the future, that God has things in their future that are going to be helpful. We know in reading the New Testament about Agabus that he was someone who spoke a word and he had such a sterling reputation that when he said there was a famine coming, coming to the church, that the entire church of the world at that time prepared for that famine because his words were accurate. He had a reputation for accuracy. And this is the nature of the prophet ministry. They have developed a reputation over time. They don't just spring up out of nowhere and are prophets, but they go through that sequence we've been talking about. They begin to function in the gift of prophecy, as we talked about in the first session. They become people who operate regularly in that gift of prophecy and develop accuracy through the life gift of prophecy. And then finally, they come to a point where they are accurate. Can they make mistakes? Yes, but generally speaking, they simply don't because they, their words become more and more uh, accountable and it is important that those prophetic ministries are, have reached a point where they know the voice of the Lord and they only speak when God is speaking. Legitimate prophetic ministry are those people who know when to speak and when not to speak. They have lost all sense of trying to get affirmation from people. They are not looking for people to validate them or not validate them. They're extremely focused on what is God saying and then to speak what God is saying at the time that he's speaking it and then not to speak when God is not speaking. True prophetic ministry are not uh, anxious to speak a word for God. They are anxious to only speak when God is speaking. They have matured to a level where they understand that that gift is God's and it's in His hands. And they are not going to speak when God is not speaking. They will speak when God is speaking. They only say what God is saying and no more. I've used the analogy of the male person or the mailman. Let me, let me just use that gender term, even though our male person is female. I think mailman is just easier for me to use. Um, the mailman analogy is so, uh, I think, perfect for prophetic ministry. And uh, as I've shared, but perhaps want to just uh, uh, go a little deeper today, prophetic ministry is really like a mailman. It is someone that comes to your house and delivers a letter. The letter is not from them. It's from someone else. It's for you. Maybe they deliver a, a letter or they deliver a package. The design of a mailman is to come to your house and make sure that you get the package in the exact condition that it was sent. So if the person brings that to you and the package is all broken and is all ruined, well, they haven't done their job as a mailman. Now, it probably isn't their fault. It happened back at the office. But for the purposes of understanding here. The male person is responsible that the, the package is delivered in the condition that it was originally sent. A prophetic minister is a mailman. It is someone who delivers that package precisely as it was given to them. They deliver it to the person that it was intended for, and that is their function. They are not there to make sure that that package is opened or that it is received properly, or whatever happens to that package after it's given to the person is none of their business. True prophets are not interested and not in any way focused on making sure that the words they speak come to pass. And where prophetic ministry has gotten into trouble, and I've seen this experientially, unfortunately, is they'll take a word, maybe God gives them a legitimate word for someone, but then they get involved in that person's life. And they try to give them advice on how to and how and what to do with that word. Not their business. I had a prophetic minister a number of years ago, and it's a sad note, quite frankly, that God really used in a special way for a number of months in our church. And unfortunately, they became very prideful. 
They began to think that because they were being used prophetically, that somehow God was casting favor on them different than everybody else. And that's always one of the great weaknesses of prophetic ministry. People can begin to think that they're more important than other people. That's a real downfall. And pastors have weaknesses, and teachers have weaknesses, and apostles have weaknesses. But I would say prophetic ministers, their key witness, or their key weakness, I should say, is pride. That's why they re need to remain humble. That's why people that are usually in prophetic ministry, God brings them through a, a number of humbling circumstances to just remind them that this ministry is not about them at all, but just about delivering the word that God has given them. This particular prophetic minister, after six or seven months of really God using in dramatic and powerful ways, began to think that they were more important. And then they began to get involved. They gave me, a word was given to me, for example, that, or a supposed word was given to me, that this was what the Lord wanted to do in my life, and here's what God was doing in our city. And they asked me to investigate a particular uh, ministry that was happening in our city. And so I went down to investigate that ministry. I listened to it. I paid attention to it, but it really wasn't something that was of any interest to me, and I wasn't going to pursue it. However, that prophetic ministry minister became very upset because they said, this person or this ministry is extremely important. You need to join with them, and this is part of a revival that's happening in our city and all these kind of ideas. And I said, well, I don't agree. I don't really believe that this is the direction that God is having me to go or for our church to go, and I don't necessarily believe that this is what God has in mind for our city. They became very upset with me and became angry with me and actually then pronounced an, a judgment against me. Because you have not received this word, God is doing this and that and the other thing. And I finally said, no, that isn't God, and I don't receive that word. You see, any prophetic ministry is also accountable. And I just said to that particular individual, no, this isn't what God is saying at all. I don't agree, and I'm not going to pursue this ministry any further. Well, they left our church. That's a clear example of where prophetic ministry has gotten out of balance because pride gets involved. Someone who is a prophetic minister, someone who is being raised up in prophetic ministry is not someone who carries out that word. They don't have the authority to make that word happen. Now I'm sharing all this with you not simply as a teaching, but you as a leader. God has called you and I to raise up people in prophecy, life gifts of prophecy, and prophetic ministry. However, if we don't believe in it, or if we believe that it doesn't have any value, I can tell you something. God isn't going to send people our way that we're going to train up for this kind of ministry. We need to believe in it, not because someone tells you to believe in it, but in every case, as because the scriptures teach us that prophetic ministry is a, it plays one-fifth a part of maturing saints in the in the things of God, according to Ephesians chapter 4. The church will only come into maturity when all five ministries are functioning properly. We play a role on a local level to raise up, to validate legitimate prophetic ministry, to bring uh, legitimate accountability to these ministries so that people can come into the callings that they have. I have no doubt that God has called certain people in your church into some aspect of prophetic ministry. But if you as a leader are not equipping them and training them and teaching them, then either they'll leave your church and go somewhere else and do damage because they're not properly equipped, or they really won't have the value that God intended to have for your church. And this is why I really honestly believe that prophetic ministry and your understanding of it as a pastor is critical. Search the scriptures. That's your calling. That's my calling. Search the scriptures. What does the New Testament teach about prophecy, life gifts of prophecy, and prophetic ministry? We need to be raising up prophets and apostles and pastors and evangelists and teachers. They need to be trained by us. Our job is not simply to keep teaching sermons for 30 years and go retire somewhere. That's not pastoral ministry by the New Testament standard. We're supposed to be raising up people to be qualified ministers of the New Testament. I have to say, as I look at the churches throughout the United States and even the world, we're really not doing that. We're kind of have a glorified baby sitting service. We, we bring people to our churches, we preach a sermon, good sermon, pastor, they go home, they have lunch, and that's the end of it. That's not what the church is designed to do. We're designed to raise up ministers, We're to train people to do the work of ministry. The work of ministry is apostolic, it's prophetic, it's evangelistic, it's pastoral, and it's teaching. So I hope that these series of, ministry, of, of teachings have had some measure of urging you to Get back to the scriptures, study what the Lord wants you to do, raise up people and encourage people in these gifts, 
because they're designed ultimately for God's glory. I, I really encourage you to read and, and to study scriptures along this line. Now, before we go, you know that I always end each podcast with a quote, especially for you. This one is from the book, The Equipping Church by Sue Mallory. She says, to get leaders to become stakeholders in ministry and to understand the DNA of your church, you must invest in them, equip them, and raise the bar of accountability. Before you go, would you mind subscribing to my channel? This is one of the ways that you can help Ministers Toolbox reach other leaders and encourage them in their faith. Uh, this started as a labor of love a number of years ago, and it'll continue to be so uh, as long as that I'm doing this. And I, I wanna just get resources into your hands that would encourage you in the ministry, strengthen your ability to do that. Too many pastors are leaving the ministry discouraged and for, for a variety of different reasons, and that needs to stop. So we wanna play our part in helping and encouraging you. So if this ministry has been an encouragement to you, please subscribe. And if you can leave a comment, that would even be better. Thank you so much. Take care. For more resources, go to ministerstoolbox.com. Thanks for listening.